Well, Mike, we've made it to episode two. How have you enjoyed it so far? Um, yeah, it's really good. I'm having the best time of my life. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Twitter, are you enjoying it? Yeah, everyone's loving me, uh, me giveaway sack. It's nice to uh, find and make some friends and stuff, especially ones that are stuck back in time with me. Yeah, it's been uh, quite good engagement since that first one. Ah, they're good lads and lasses. So, I do have to mention something before we press that rewind button back to 92. Watching that fast last week in the Tottenham Liverpool game just confirms what I said in episode one, really, didn't it? How can we ever get decisions so wrong in modern football? All that technology we've got available? Complete joke. And it's always something that I will be touching on as we go through future episodes. Um, but yeah, I think it's time to go back. Well, we're going back to a time where the rules have just changed then. We've just introduced the back pass rule. So we're going to have a lot of confusion and comedy moments involving defenders and goalkeepers not having a clue what to do, which you saw with the Wimbledon game last week for Lee Chapman's first goal. Yeah, but technology... Oh yeah, that's ruined it. VAR's killed the game. That's why we're here. Wow. So let's go back to a time where VAR officials didn't exist. We didn't have all them energy drinks and them supplements at half-time just to get through another 45 minutes of football. All they needed then? Big juicy segment of orange. So let's go back and relive the league. Welcome back to 1992. The year was short the Freddie Mercury concert for AIDS. Chelsea superfan John Major was in number 10. David Bowie married model Iman. And everybody was a dancer, especially Rhythm. The snap had us dancing like nobody was watching. The Olympics were held in Barcelona, Death Becomes Her was in cinemas, Mum and Dad were playing Echo the Dolphin, Super Mario Kart and Street Fighter 2. Bet Lynch and Alec Gilroy were running the Rovers' return, Sharon, Grant and Phil ran the Queen Vic in an innocent three-way, and Tony moved in with Gary after being impressed with his U-shaped seating amenity in Men Behaving Badly. And the love of my life was born. Gladiators. But, anyway, back to the football. And we start today's episode on Tuesday, the 18th of August, 1992, with Blackburn add on to Arsenal. Blackburn against Arsenal kicks us off this week. Blackburn on the back of an entertaining 3-3 draw with Palace last week. Zero. Arsenal, stinker in the second half, conceding four goals against Norwich. George Graham is admitted he's worried about the losing the physical edge to the team, uh, but he is trying to transition to a more attacking style of football, so hopefully we can see something uh, like that this week. Yeah, he said, we've always been good about the physical side of the game. It's always been one of our strengths, and we're trying to play good football, and I think that's right, but there's a balance and they have to find it. And obviously the second half last week, Atrocious. Just the one change in the starting lineup for Blackburn with Jason Wilcox coming in for Alan Wright. And of course, home debuts for Tim Sherwood, Stuart Ripley, and Alan Shearer. Shearer! On the subs bench is Matt Dickens, Chris Price, and Roy Wegley. Just the one change also for Arsenal with Jimmy Carter coming in for Paul Merson. Obviously, the back five is Seaman, Adams, Bold, Winterburn, and Dixon. And the bench, Jim Wilt, Colin Pates, and Petty Groves. Obviously, Blackburn's adventure under Jack Walker has cost them a little bit of money, but has brought them success. They're looking to further this with an expansion on the stadium, bringing them further into line with the superb Premier League. Obviously hoping to build a fortress of success to bring to Blackburn, spearheaded by Alan Shearer. And it was Shearer who made the difference after a Great ball down the wing by Stuart Ripley. Showed some great strength on the wing. Oh, that was a bit of weakness. And he cuts inside just like last week. And ham hang on. Alan Chuck, that one off, buddy. That, that is an own goal. Run off and share how you will. But that is an own goal. Great goal now. by Shearer. No, no, Third I mean, goal of the season. Some serious limbs, though. I'm a big fan of that. And obviously, a cheeky little Shearer getting a cuddle off Mark Atkins. They're happy at Blackburn. Arsenal carrying on their losing streak. Well, favourites. 
against the, the purchases. But Alan Shearer coming, coming, well, he's proven good, isn't he? And after the game, Alan Shearer some nice words to say about the man who forked out all that money for him. He said, I certainly owe him a lot for helping me establish myself in the Premier League and I intend to do my best to repay him. It's been brilliant for me here so far. I'm really relaxed, I'm enjoying myself. This is only the start, of course. But who knows how far we could go? Who knows, eh, Alan? Dream big, kid. Wimbledon host Ipswich and the crowd tonight had less than 5,000 spectators. This big new Premier League all singing, all dancing stage, less than 5,000 spectators in the stadium. Let's see what this brings. Wimbledon were hampered by the absence of John Fashnu and John Scales, the, the most forceful attacker and the steadiest defender. Both were injured. Um, John Scales was replaced by Dean Blackwell. And the only other change saw Andy Clark replaced by Greg Berry. And there's no changes for Ipswich this week, who have gone with the same lineup as game one. And with Terry Phelan trying to force a move away from Wimbledon, looking likely to go to Crystal Palace for a £3.4 million fee, obviously will help the club, which is going to be needed with low gate receipts like 4000 the injured John Scales must have been sat wincing in the stands at the lack of marking as Gavin Johnson scored the decisive goal in the 38th minute. While the build-up was superb, Chris Kiwamia coming off his marker to feed Mick Stockwell down the right, Wimbledon's defence was all at sea when the centre came across and Johnson had the luxury of finding himself unmarked eight yards out from goal and he beat Ann Sagers with a low drive. 1-0 to Ipswich. Ipswich deserved credit for some neat incisive play building up from the back in contrast to Wimbledon's more basic approach. Well, Ipswich, first win of the season. And joking is Wimbledon with another dismal display. Now to Wednesday the 19th of August 1992 for the second night in this Premier League midweek double header. Sheffield Wednesday host Nottingham Forest following their one-all draw away at Everton on the opening game of the season. Nottingham Forest had a brilliant start, smashing Liverpool 1-0. Let's see how they can go today. And of course, increasing speculation about Teddy Sheringham soon to be leaving and possibly joining Tottenham Hotspur. Let's keep an eye on that one. Oh, Teddy, Teddy. Trevor Francis has made two changes today in the Sheffield Wednesday lineup with Chris Bart Williams and Danny Wilson coming in for the injured Chris Waddle and Graham Hyde. The substitutes for Sheffield Wednesday are Kevin Pressman, American John Harkes and Trevor Francis. Legendary manager Brian Clough naming an unchanged side for the phase into Hillsborough. And the substitutes are Andy Marriott, Arsenal target Kingsley Black and Gary Bannister. The man hoping to impress England manager Graham Taylor, David Hurst put Sheffield Wednesday ahead in the 15th minute, rounding off a neat move involving Danny Wilson and Nigel Pearson with a vicious left foot shot high and wide of Mark Crossley. 1-0 Wednesday and Hurst secured the points for Sheffield Wednesday today in the first Premier League win with his second goal 10 minutes from time when his free kick found a way through the forest wall and beyond Crossley into the bottom corner. Brilliant win for Sheffield Wednesday, 2-0. David Hurst on the score sheet with two goals, really staking claim for that England squad. On the other hand, Nottingham Forest, very lacklustre performance today. Well, I do worry for them if they do sell uh, Teddy Sheringham, but He's let's see what Tottenham. happens. A terrible start for Liverpool last week, losing 1-0 away at Forest. And Teddy Sheringham getting the first goal on Sky Super Sunday. Sheffield United, cracking win against the Red Devils. Baffling them with their long ball tactics. Big Brian Dean. Superb, isn't he? Two changes for Liverpool this week, with Steve McManaman and Mark Wright coming in for Nick Tanner and Ian Rush. Home debuts for David James and Paul Stewart, and a bench of Bruce Grobelar, Nick Tanner and Ronnie Rosenthal. One change for Sheffield United this week with Alan Cork making way for Ian Bryson. And a bench of Alan Kelly, Charlie Hatfield and Alan Cork. Two goal hero from Saturday, Brian Dean struck when David Burrows was caught out in two minds in the 36th minute when he was clearly contemplating a back pass to David James. Burrows hesitated fatally and Dean bludgeoned his way past him. 
took the ball to the edge of the box and lashed it right-footed past Liverpool's goalkeeper, making his own debut. The equaliser came from Liverpool when Ronnie Whelan switched his sights to the left in the 44th minute and curled a pass out to Mark Walters. He cut inside and swept the ball right-footed under the diving Simon Tracy. And then it was time for the fairy tale. Anfield debut star Paul Stewart ruined Sheffield United's early season Christmas party as the Reds' £2.2 million summer signing struck the home side's winner in the 66th minute when he ghosted in at the back post to slide home Dean Saunders' clever chip. First three points for Liverpool this season. Sheffield United couldn't build on last week's big win against Man United. Another goal for Brian Dean though. Queen's Park Rangers are at home to Southampton. Again, both of these teams drew their opening game of the season. Will either of these teams find their first win of the season today? QPR making a change in goal, with Tony Roberts coming in for Jan Steschkal, who was superb between the posts on Monday night. And the subs today for QPR are Peter Caldwell, Danny Maddox and Gary Thompson. Likewise, with Southampton, just the one change today to the starting eleven, with Kevin Moore coming in for Richard Hall. And the substitutes for Southampton are Ian Andrews, Jeff Kenner and Ian Dowie. Southampton have built themselves a reputation of being a right bunch of dirty pigs and today they got themselves three yellow cards and Mickey Adams was sent off late on at Loftus Road. Matthew Letizia gave Southampton the lead in the 31st minute with the least impressive goal he'll ever score. Queen's Park Rangers had a man on a mission and that man's name was Leslie. So here you are ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Leslie Ferdinand equalising to make it 1-1. And in the 70th minute, Jerry Francis's famous set-piece playbook was used and Ray Wilkins laid one back for David Bardsley to crack one home from 30 yards. And QPR kept pushing right until the end. Dennis Bailey impressing, teeing one up for Mr. Leslie Ferdinand to make it 3-1 with four minutes to go. Les Ferdinand getting two today from a combined total of one and a half yards. And as I mentioned earlier, Southampton have made quite the reputation of being a set of dirty pigs. With the Football Association imposing a fine of £20,000 on them last week, with £15,000 of it suspended for the season, after Southampton's five reds and an unbelievable 80 yellows last season. So unsurprisingly, there was a right good old Barney down at Loftus Road with eight men involved and referee Ray Bigger had to consult his linesman before dismissing Mickey Adams, booking Glenn Cockrell and QPR hero Les Ferdinand. A great win for uh, Queen's Park Rangers against Southampton, 3-1. That's four points on the board after two games. Unbeaten. Unbeaten, yeah. So Southampton, a bit of a poor start, only one point after the two games, but there's plenty of time to go. And we have the first goal in many compilation with Matt Letizia getting off the score sheet in the Premier League. Norwich at home to Chelsea after an impressive uh, victory last week away at Arsenal. 4-2, comeback Kings. Chelsea drew 1-0 last week against Oldham. And it's a tale of the two new signings up front with Mark Robbins and Mick Harford starting. Both getting on the score sheet in the first game. Only one change in the Norwich lineup this week with Chris Sutton dropping to the bench and Mark Robbins getting the deserved start. Norwich substitutes are Mark Walton, Ian Crook, and Chris Sutton. Same with Chelsea, only making one change, and it's Norwich old by Robert Fleck that misses out and Joe Allen comes in. And on the Chelsea bench, you've got Kevin Hitchcock playing the Kevin Hitchcock role, Eddie Newton playing the Eddie Newton role, and John Spencer. Chelsea recently joined the race for Wimbledon's once away defender Terry Phelan, looking likely to either go to one of three clubs between Crystal Palace, Man City and of course Chelsea. Chelsea started the better of the suicides, taking the lead after 15 minutes, some impressive build-up play and then a great cross from Mick Harford met by Graham Stewart who knocks it past Brian Gunn. 1-0 to Chelsea. And then, Mike Walker worked his magic again. After 57 minutes, a thunderous drive by David Phillips, who cut in from the left to unleash a fearsome 25-yard shot past Dave Bessett's right hand. 
and two minutes later, Mark Robbins, Friday's £800,000 buy from Manchester United, stole unmarked into the area to gently chip Besant from Gary Megson's cross with an audacious first-time volley with the outside of his boot. The man brought in to replace local hero Robert Fleck when the Scot was sold to Chelsea for £2 million, hit a clinical strike that killed off the Londoners and Mark Robbins' third goal of the season. Outstanding result for Norwich today. Two wins out of two, six points, three goals for Mark Robbins. Excellent start. Chelsea struggling, still looking for their first win. Oldham at home to Crystal Palace. Both drew their opening games of the season. One change in the starting lineup for Oldham today, with Neil Poynton coming in for Andy Barlow. Of course, both Neil Poynton and Steve Redmond making their home debuts after signing from Manchester City in the summer. The substitutes for Oldham are John Keeley, Craig Fleming and an 18-year-old Neil Tolson. Again, just the one change for Crystal Palace today, with Lee Sinock coming in as extra defensive cover and Mark Bright misses out. The substitutes for Crystal Palace are Paul Held, Dean Gordon and super sub Simon Osborne. In the 16th minute, Norwegian fullback Gunnar Haller lofted in a deep cross and Nick Henry chested it down and absolutely rangooned it against the bar. Roger Palmer leapt like a salmon, but it was a salmon on Tesco's fish counter. And ex-Everton goal-scoring hero Graham Sharp slices one into the bottom corner. 1-0 Oldham. And in the first serious attack in the second half... Chris Coleman timed his pass perfectly for Eddie McGoldrick's long run from the right and the versatile 27-year-old who scored only three goals in three seasons took his chance brilliantly. And just like German legend Franz Beckenbauer, Eddie McGoldrick playing the box-to-box -box sweeper role today, playing in defence, midfield and attack. So both teams remain unbeaten after the two games that they both played, drawing both games. An Everton legend, Graham Sharp, getting off the mark in the Premier League. And everybody's favourite footballer, Eddie McGoldrick, scoring as well. Middlesbrough's first home game of the season against Manchester City. Neither team could find the win last week. Two changes in the starting lineup for Borough this week. With Ian Ironside coming in in goal for Stephen Pearce. And Robbie Mustard misses out with Bernie Slaven coming in. Middlesbrough's three substitutes are Ben Roberts, Jamie Pollock and Robbie Musto. Man City name an unchanged side from the game on Monday night. And the substitutes are Martin Maggotson, Peter Reid names himself and Mike Sharon. Not even the tragedy which struck Paul Lake could totally explain or excuse this latest Ayrson Park nightmare for Man City. The Blues, it must be said, looked totally devastated when the luckless Lake was carried off after less than 10 minutes with an injury to his suspect knee, which has implications too awful to even contemplate. City had justifiable grounds for complaint with the dangerous Bernie Slaven looking yards offside when he ran through unchallenged to slide the ball past the helpless Tony Corton, but it gave Borough a richly deserved lead. And Borough's and Bernie Slaven's second goal, only two minutes later, will give Peter Reid nightmares with the little striker giving the freedom of the park to nod John Endry's right-wing cross back and beyond the unprotected Corton. Any slight chance City had of rescuing the dying cause disappeared completely midway through the first half when the usually affable Niall Quinn let his frustrations boil over with a stupid oh, and totally uncharacteristic swing of a punch at Borough striker Paul Wilkinson. It left referee Steve Lodge no alternative but to show a red card to the Irishman, becoming the first ever red card in the newly formed Premier League. There's the answer for your quiz questions, boys. Good start on for Borough. 2-0. Man City still looking for that first win of the season. Still got the edge over Man United though, haven't they? One point ahead of them. Leeds are away at Aston Villa. Leeds last week, 1-2-1. One, one. Great start to the season for them. Villa drew one all away at Ipswich. Let's see how they go on today. 
Yeah, they're only making one change today with Dwight York coming in for Steve Froggett. Of course, the bench of Les Seeley, Hugo Hekiog and Silla Regis. And Leeds have gone with exactly the same team that won the first game of the season um, with Mervyn Day, Steve Hodge and Gordon Strachan on the bench. The match at Villa Park today appeared to be heading towards a goalless draw before Villa forced three successful left-sided corners. From the third, taken by captain Kevin Richardson, Cyril Regis flicked on from the near post and the determined Daly and Atkinson nudged the ball home off goalkeeper John Lukic and the left post. 1-0 Villa. But Leeds, who immediately brought on Gordon Strachan for the weary Eric Cantona, levelled in the 83rd minute. Steve Hodge, once a Villa, and a half-time replacement for the injured David Batty, my dad's mate, pushed the ball forward. Paul McGrath failed to clear and speed scored through the legs of luckless Nigel Spink leaving the Leeds fans in raptures in the away end at Villa Park, celebrating a 1-1 draw. So both teams start unbeaten after two games. Man United, atrocious start to the season, getting beat by Sheffield United last week. Looking to bounce back though against Everton, who only could draw with Chef Wednesday one all. No changes in the starting lineup for Manchester United this week, with a subs bench of Gary Walsh, a 29-year-old Mike Phelan, and Dion Dublin yet to get his first start after his move from Cambridge. Two changes for Everton with Alan Harper coming in for Matt Jackson and Robert Vazitzer. Who? Uh, uh, yeah, him. The, the guy with the tash coming in for Peter Beagley. The scoreline flattered an unadventurous Everton and the astonishing result represents a crushing blow to Man United in their attempt to put the agonies of last season's championship collapse behind them. Ferguson's team find themselves propping up the Premier League table along with anti-post favourites Arsenal after a surprisingly lackluster display. Now, in the 80s and early 90s, Peter Beardsley's style of play was watched keenly in some regions of Argentina, and especially with this goal as he raced away and gave Everton the lead, 1-0. And it's all well and good for the citizens of Argentina to replicate Peter Beardsley's style and play, but no one will be able to get that speed that low centre of gravity, that skill, and that precision finish. Oh, totally. Not a chance. Good, son. Good. Finish. Man United did threaten with some forward play, but never really looked dangerous. One of the best shots in the first half. Well, there you go. Bounced straight out. Hoofed on clear. Polish winger, Robert Bazicka. Bazitza, huh? you know. He runs onto the ball, cuts Gary Palace into ribbons, chops him up again and then scores, well, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Robert Barzitza. Who? And Peter Beardsley. 2-0 to Toffees. And this goal is obviously going to be played over and over again for many years to come. Look at the skill, the pace, the power. What a player. This is Gary Pallister he's cutting into ribbons here, by the way, not just any other defender. And then he's still got to beat the European champion, Peter Schmeichel, who makes himself big, and he slots it away coolly. Possibly the best goal in the Premier League by a man with a tash. Man United manager Alex Ferguson finally gave in to the fans, please, to bring on Dion Dublin, who helped with a hospital tackle straight to Peter Beagry, who gave a long ball clear, and Everton could hardly believe the luck, as Maurice Johnson completed a resounding victory in the dying seconds by making Peter Schmeichel look a dejected fool. 3 0 to the Toffees. And after bottling the championship last season, Man United carry that form on. Losing 3-0, bottom of the league, no points, great win for Everton. Who would have thought Everton would have done this? And everyone, take a moment, rewind. Well, you can watch the Peter Schmeichel error and take some joy from that. But go watch the big Polish winger with Atashi's goal again. What a goal. Not the best start for Alex Ferguson in his mission to knock Liverpool off their perch. Tottenham Hotspur welcome Coventry City to White Hart Lane this evening. Of course. They are looking for their first ever Premiership goal after a drab 0-0 away performance at Southampton. Coventry City are looking to go 2-2 two two after an impressive opening win against Middlesbrough. Doug Livermore naming an unchanged side from the 0-0 draw away at Southampton, but providing home debuts for Neil Ruddock, Jason Cundy and Darren Anderton. The substitutes for Tottenham were Eric Torsford, Andy Gray and John Hendry. Bobby Gold also going with an unchanged side after an impressive win against Middlesbrough at the weekend. He's picked his own son, Jonathan, as the substitute goalkeeper. Lloyd McGrath and a first appearance on Relive the League for Peter and Love. And if you didn't know by now, Coventry City's new £250,000 signing from Swansea, John Williams, was nicknamed the Flying Postman. Because, well, 
he used to be a postman. And the previous season, he won the Rumbelows Sprint Challenge. With Rumbelows being the sponsor of the League Cup, they decided it was a great idea to find the fastest player in the 92 clubs in the Football League with the final to be showcased at the League Cup final. And to find the truest fastest player in the 92, we had regional heats, which were showcased on the St. and Greasy show. <laughs> heart and give the better odds on the fastest football I've got. Of Swansea, the next this postman, this lad. I know, I bet the old dog couldn't catch him, mate. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. yeah, he was off, wasn't he? Oh, right. him. <laughs> Love <laughs> <laughs> Absolute classic from Greavesy. Naturally, the flying postman eased through the semi finals and qualified for a final which also included Michael Jilks of Reading, Tony Witter of QPR, Lee Jenkinson from Hull, Sheffield United's Adrian Littlejohn, Bournemouth striker Effa Nakoku, and Mansfield's Paul Fleming. And even after a slow start, Williams eased through the field to finish in 11.49 seconds, winning a cheque for £10,000 and a new TV from Rumbelows. Oh, yeah, Tottenham. They played Coventry City at White Hart Lane. And Coventry City's new striker, John Williams, must think he's living in a dream world. He scored in his debut against Middlesbrough on Saturday after nine and a half minutes. And today, he scored twice against a club whose fans know a thing or two about great strikers. And Tottenham's plans changed early after Jason Cundy suffered a nasty looking head wound after a collision with John Williams, funnily enough. And it was Cundy's absence that was felt four and a half minutes in. With a corner from Mickey Jin, Ian Walker flapped at the ball under pressure from Robert Rosario, and the Coventry striker's header was kicked off the goal line by Paul Allen. However, the ball only fell as far as Williams, who had the simple task of tapping in from two yards. And after 30 minutes, Williams made it too showing the sort of speed that made him the Rumble or Sprint champion last season. He collected Mickey Jin's through ball and race clear, hitting the post on the way in, making it 2-0 to Coventry. Well, we still wait for Tottenham to score their first Premier League goal. Poor performance. Brilliant by Coventry today. 2-0, making it two wins out of two. There was further trouble for Tottenham, however as Gordon Jory was involved in an astonishing feud with top referee Dermot Gallagher as Spurs slumped to a shock defeat. The £2.2 million record signing angrily wagged his finger in the face of the referee after the final whistle. Jory was still fuming at a 65th minute clash with Coventry's giant centre-half Andy Pearce that left him clutching his face after crashing to the ground. But Pearce insisted there was no headbutt and Dermot Gallagher agreed. Booked both players as reporting jury for cheating to the Football Association. And that brings us to the end of week two of Relive the League and this week's unofficial, official Premier League Player of the Week is Middlesbrough's Bernie Slaven, the club legend getting two more goals to add to an impressive goal tally of over 140 goals. Great start to the season from Norwich and Coventry, taking maximum points so far from two games. The only story is though at the bottom of the table, with the two title contenders battling out for the bottom of the table with the luckless Wimbledon on zero points from two. Join us next time on Relive the League where we may have an end to the willy won't he terry Feelin transfer saga. Will Dion Dublin ever get a start for Man United? Will Man United ever get a point? Will Tottenham ever score? Let's find out. <laughs>